uh, because Margarita was as American as you could be, yes, in spite of being Italian. Um, I would say probably when he when he came to this country and performed, um, which she must have, I don't know how, I knew that Mother was maybe a sponsor on something. I have a few uh, programs still. Mm -hmm. um, it would show that father was a, um, a sponsor of some concert in which Tuscany was involved. Now they were responsible for getting him to the States? No. To, no. Okay. Father Sarnoff. Okay. Uh, General Sarnoff, the head of NBC, okay. got, got him to come. Um, but I, I don't know how. There's a long story, and it's a public one about it. Yes. how they got <coughs> Tuscany to come here. And uh, he would never perform in Italy. <coughs> and uh, so then there's, you get to the NBC Symphony, a whole wonderful um, stories about um, Tuscany behaved and how the men were all afraid of him, but they were not afraid of him really. And he would throw his butts on and, and act up when he thought it was effective. He was a very funny man, Tuscany, <coughs> with a terrific sense of humor, and he absolutely delighted in embarrassing Mother because Mother got very red in the face. If, if, if she were in the spotlight or if anybody said anything to her. And Tuscanini thought that was absolutely delicious. So any time he could think of something to embarrass him, he would say it, and mother would blush. So that was very funny. And, uh, let's see. and I have a lot of Tuscanini stories. And my stories are all written down. They're all together. And they are all things that I actually observed with my own eyes and heard with my own ears. Can so you tell us one story about Tuskegee that you wrote down? Oh, yes. And I can tell you any number. Tell um, us one that you particularly like. Well, I think my favorite story is, is the one in which he was listening to the radio in our house with the uh, director of the Metropolitan Opera Company. And, uh, and now I can't think of his name, but I will. It's down there. Anyway. And uh, the director of the Metropolitan sent it us for me. They were listening to Grace Moore singing. Mm -hmm. And the man says to Toscanini, my God, my stroke. She's made the same mistake she made 20 years ago. <laughs> and Toscanini said very quietly, she has a good memory. <laughs> that was my favorite. Yeah, that's a great yeah. one. And the other uh, was that we had a painting of Christ on the cross in, the, in our living room. And at one concert that Toscanini didn't particularly think was so good, he said, I envy him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Toscanini stories are unbelievable. And at one point, we hired a cook, and she had been Toscanini's cook. Wow. And, well, there must have been a reason that you hired her. And, and yeah. The interesting thing is that she said he was so neat that he put his shoes in perfect lines in his closet and that every time he washed his hands, he wiped the, the sink dry and he was so neat. Yeah. Know, and that's a personal story that nobody would have known. Now, what, if you had Toscanini's cook, you probably had some of Toscanini's favorite dishes. Did she cook things specially that he liked? That I don't, you do? I don't yeah. remember anything special about it yeah. at all. Um, oh, a 
another thing I remember, which uh, two, two of us, all, all my Tuscany stories are, are, are written down and together. But uh, one was that when we were in Salzburg, Toscanini sat down on the piano and played an entire opera for us. Mm. And nobody knew that Toscanini played the piano. Wow. And, and it was just absolutely stunning. Uh, and the other, the other stories that are in there, Toscanini told us how he what, how he found out he had an unusual memory. He was studying, he was a cellist, and uh, his teacher had a, had a birthday, and all the pupils thought it would be very nice to celebrate it by playing one of the compositions that the teacher had composed. Tels they didn't have any music, and Toscanini found that he could remember the whole thing. Um, and the other, the other thing about it, he had both a visual memory and a sound memory. And at one time, he wanted a telephone number, and Toscanini visualized a, a calling card of the embassy or something, and there he could just read off that telephone number in his mind. Wow. So that was his visual memory, and the other was the sound memory. And those were the ways in which he realized that he had this. But uh, it is always, uh, to me, very unusual that a person will have uh, an extraordinary amount of both kinds of memory. Yes. And, and uh, Toscanini was one of the few people who did that I've met. Yeah. Um, usually, you remember the sound much better, right. or you remember the picture much better. Right. It's true. They're not equally divided. Yeah. And uh, well, people don't make use of that. Mm -hmm. Mother did. Mother realized that when there was a little uh, Herbert Bajour, one of the Bajour boys, could not learn to read, and school gave up on him, and mother took him in hand and discovered that he had a, a great love of art, and that he could remember things through pictures, and she got him to read, where the school had failed. Well, you, you've inherited that visual memory. The visual, but I'm not the other. Not the other, I, I don't have, you know, uh, now this, not that musical. I never understood where Nona got into the violin. How did she become a violin player? How did music, she become a musician? Well, was it in her, from her family? Yeah, they, they, did, they got her lessons. They gave her violin lessons. And did any of the other sisters become in, no, into the music? Not a, not not a single one. Aunt Rosalie attended concerts, you know, right. as prestige, I think. But uh, I have a, a whole, um, I had started a, a sort of a description of mother's family and the personalities yes. of brothers and sisters. And uh, so I'm trying to at least get some of the highlights that I observed about these these brothers and sisters. I, mean, I think Aunt Rosalie's uh, devotion to the family was very misunderstood by oh. uh, Aunt Florine's children, Rosalie and Roger, were afraid of Aunt Rosalie. Huh. They didn't realize that, you know, all this sternness was was out of affection and uh, you know that she was very stiff lady in, in many ways so they went around being afraid of her and that was too bad because she was really wonderful but she would say even to me are you wearing a girdle well if you're not you should be or you know 
all kinds of critical things, but they were all, you know, affectionately so. And, and so speaking of girdles, yes. did Nona wear a girdle? Oh, yes. All her life? All her life, and Aunt Florine, too, and Nina. She Nina did for a while. Wrote a wonderful poem about oh, the, the unhooking of the girdle and the flesh coming out. It was just, it's very, very funny. And I have that. Did you wear a girdle? Yes, I did, but not a, not a, not a, not a corset. Yeah, not I wore more a way. girdle until, my goodness, probably almost until I came to. Uh, I but it went with stockings, right? That was the purpose. That was the thing. It held yeah, up your stockings. stockings. Or that was just a. But some people just wore a kind of a, a band with the long, right things hanging yeah. from it. But uh, the other funny story about the girdle was the Ahudis' little sisters both were plump and wore, wore corsets. They were stuffed into them as little children. Oh. And uh, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Manuel kept telling my mother that mother needed to feed me more eggs to, to fatten me up a little bit. So I immediately took a great dislike to girdles. But it was terribly funny to see those two little girls. And, and they were adorable little, little girls and terribly smart. And I remember our games. We always played, uh, uh, what's the deal? What's the game where you act out words? Ah. Yeah, yeah. Charades. 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 The two little girls uh, were playing charades, and the good little girls were in, and and they came running in. What's an ion? They said, and they were about <laughs> six years old. You know, they were so smart. <laughs> and uh, and Yehudi, his favorite. His masterpiece in charades was to do Beethoven. He did beat and oven. <laughs> that was Beethoven. <laughs> and, and we had a way of playing charades at Rosalie Leventritt's apartment. There was a, a bathroom and a bedroom and another bedroom on the other side of the bathroom and the hall opposite it. So we would make a circle. The person who was going to act the thing out would go out in the hall, come back through the bathroom, and act out the syllable. And uh, that's how we did that. And every time the menuans came to New York, at least one time, we'd all get together and do charades. So this was very, very, very cute. And it was Rosalie Leventritt and me and Yehudi and sometimes the little girls. Um, there was one other family that Yehudi played with, but she didn't play, she didn't do charades with us, and that was Fifi Garbeck. Her father was a, a doctor, and he gave Yehudi his violin, his, his uh, uh, Stradivarius violin. And there was a big, a big nasty story in which he was ill and he asked for Yehudi to come and play for him. And Mr. Manuel wouldn't do it. Wow. He said that Yehudi didn't give three concerts. And he had given Yehudi his life. And that caused a rift uh, for quite a long time. Uh, he, he, he obviously survived. Huh? Did he was he dying when he asked him to come? I don't or just know. Ill? Yeah. I don't wow. know, but I know that that's quite a story. Yehudi. It is. I don't know if it's documented anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, who told it to me. But uh, I learned it late. I, I didn't know it originally. We got to know Fifi Garbett later on. And... Uh, she married 
a fellow who worked at CBS, didn't she, Will? Who was that? Fifi Garbett. Married? Did she marry Roger Starr? Rod Rogers. No, Roger somebody else. Roger Strauss is Dolly. No, Roger Starr. Roger Starr, yes. Fifi ended up being a writer of soap operas and very successful and uh, under the name of Fifi Starr. Hmm. And so were they produced, the soap operas, Will? Oh, yes. For years and years, years and years. And huh. years. She made millions. Well, what were some like of the names? So do you remember? That's a hard one. Is a, one? Not the guiding light. Uh, Google her. She, she okay. Google her and look it up in yeah. Wikipedia, and anyway. she'll be all there. Ah, yeah. And, ah. and Roger Starr, I think, died eventually, and she remarried a television producer or something like that, who I had been in contact with or something. Everybody connects up with mm -hmm. everybody sure. else somewhere. Now, I don't know if Neil has heard the story about Nona and playing the violin. Oh, that was so great. That's such a great story. Do you know this one? I yes. Do. About but, would you tell yeah. it again? I had not heard it when you told it to us last week, the one about the hypnotist. Yes. Could you tell me that story again? Yeah, it's a great I've story. I've written that one down. Yeah. Mother was occasionally asked to help entertain at somebody's house. And we played the violin. Uh, so she was, she started to play, and she noticed there was a man looking at her and staring at her. And she found that there was strange, and she felt, you know, something coming from him. It was very strange. She tried to lift her bow and found that it was very difficult to raise her arm. And she could see and feel both that this man was attacking her with something and uh, she just couldn't play. And so finally mm -hmm. she got up and she put down her violin and she said, either you leave this room or I do. And he got up and walked out. He had been, he was also an amateur violinist and he was jealous that he wasn't shows to entertain. And I don't know who the man was, and I don't know any more about it. And uh, that's it, but it, was, it made a profound uh, impact on me. And, and it's interesting that you, you can feel if somebody is totally focused on you. you know, oh, yeah. You yeah. You can see it, especially when everybody is facing you and somebody is overdoing it. Now, did she stay with a certain group of musicians to do quartets? I remember she played quartets. Well, let me what? tell you, first of all, she and the Leventritz and the, I think it's Robeson's was the name. I don't remember that name right. But Perro Lay. Um, Pereira. Um, whatever the Levin trip was at the end. Levin trip was at the end, but how could it I don't know what the either. name is in the yeah, middle. But don't it was worry. Another one. Yeah. Oh, and that was the music musical. Well, they they heard Lillian Fuchs play and her brother Joe Fuchs mm -hmm. and they started the Parallel String Quartet and they rehearsed at our house most of the time so no matter what I was doing there was quartet playing down in the living and uh, the Parallel Quartet changed its um, you know different people went in and out of it mm -hmm. Uh, Lily and folks stayed and her brother left and they got a, new, a different violinist. And then uh, at one time, um, 
Lauren Hollander's father was really? playing wow. on the viol second violin. Or Mother occasionally played with them as second violin. Second violin. But in general, she would get a, a group of people mm -hmm. together. And she only played second violin. She, and Mother was a very, um, a little heavy in the violin. But she was so musical, and, and it was her musicality that made her so welcome. Anyway, she loved that, and she did that throughout her, uh, until she got sick and, and got her arthritis. Yes. And then, of course, when she was at her worst, she was confined to her bed until Scalini came to see her one day. And he was appalled, you know, to see that it really hurt him badly. And Mother said to him brightly, Oh, Maestro, I've taken up your, your instrument now because I need to exercise my fingers. I've taken up the cello. And Toscanini looked at him and he said, At least you could have chosen the piano. At least the notes are there. That was another little yes. gem. Not a good story. A gem. And, uh, Lydia? Yes. Do you think you'd like to take an intermission now because you're at a hard No, night. I feel as if I've snatched her bag. Yes. And she hurt her hand terribly. And then she started getting all right? Hmm. And ended up in bed. Yes. For years. Did she have two incidents of... What? Did Rosalie have two incidents of being attacked? Or just one? Two, I think just, two, just the one, one, yeah. Mm. But it was a combination of a robbery and, and a fall. Right. And, uh, you know, was it a dangerous time in New York? Yeah. And uh, let's see, I don't remember that Rosalie had arthritis before that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It huh. became so severe so yes. quickly. And uh, it was very difficult. Do any of your siblings? Put the corner and take a left. So I stopped, you know, to, yeah. to in the middle of the street the way I was supposed yeah. to. And a car for, came from behind me, and they weren't w looking at the road at all. And so my c car was pushed to one side, and I know that I sort of half fell over, hit my head on the window, and from then on I had arthritis. But what happened directly <coughs> about that is that I decided I just couldn't go through this at night alone. Uh, it was too dangerous. So I quit my part, and everybody was very mad at me. But the other reason I quit my part is that the part was very similar in many ways to a part I had just played. Mm -hmm. And it was really a, emotionally a very difficult uh, character because in both, in both cases they were unlikable characters yeah. and complex. So I quit that and uh, it was a time of floods oh. and it was very difficult anyway. But from then on I had arthritis. I eventually got worse. I went down to Scripps and had all these tests made and uh, there was nothing anybody could do. And then I started to get a sore <coughs> shoulder and that got very bad. And I was told that there was an operation you could do on a shoulder replacement, but that if I could wait, the longer I waited, the better it was, because it was a new operation. So what happened is it got worse, but it got stiff. And when it got stiff, it didn't hurt so much. Uh -huh. So that was fine. But then uh -huh. 20 years later, uh -huh. I got it in the other shoulder. That was operated on. 
but they had given me some medicine which uh, reduced my blood count so badly that they could not operate. So they did not operate, and then I got a heart attack. Oh my So goodness. finally, the following year, they did operate. Ah. And uh, the year after that, this one had gotten bad, so I had that up. And, uh, and then the year after that, I had a hip upbreak. Well, so things were... Yeah. Bionic yeah. woman here. What? You are bionic. I'm bionic. There's no... Uh, what is it? No intermissions or from life. Because Have you had any surgeries? It's, it's, it's I was in bed for almost two years. Well, I had a little surgery. No, nothing like that. Yeah. yeah. And you had back problems, weren't you? In traction? Wow. Oh, so. He had tuberculosis twice. Wow. Fall. What yeah. caused your back problem? Lydia wasn't nice to me one day. <laughs> no, really. What, oh, really. Ha what happened? Oh, really? really? No, I think this is history. With all the exercise Are you going to put that in history? History, absolutely. <laughs> well, it's on record now. Yeah, He's an yeah, anti-historian. <laughs> That's fine. Otherwise, Lydia's been very nice. I was saying that you've been very nice through the years. Well, I've been me and you've been you and we love each other. <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't <laughs> it says it all. I've been me and you've been you. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I, what I wanted to say was that no matter how hurt Lydia is, yes. whether from surgery or falling out of a car or anything, she always continues her life doing physically what you, she would do if she hadn't been hurt. Mm -hmm. Such as now she's weakened by various things, but she won't stop talking unless you leave the room. Well, I, I mean, the hours, hours. Yeah, she's a communicator. I hate, I hate doing exercises. Is that what she but I, but I do, I've always um, gotten exercise by mistake. You know, I in New York, I always ran instead of walking, and that was my exercise. But I didn't think of it as exercise. Right. I used to hunt Indian beads for seven hours at a stretch. Mm -hmm. That's a lot it was of wonderful for my bending yeah. over. In but New I, York, did you do that, or what? No, in, in Ohio. Ohio, right. And uh, so I don't like to exercise, but I love to hunt for beads. <laughs> There were so plenty of beads in that area right so around where you So everything I do, yeah. I try to, yeah. I always made a, a dance out of getting the dishes out of the, out of the closet and I lean over and present it to somebody imaginary and put it So up. you're discovering the pot at Los Luceros since no accident if you're a bead hunter. I didn't realize that you were yeah. hunting Indian beads. She loves treasure. What about Indian? Food? Well, you've discovered that complete pot of uh, Los Luceros. Yeah. And you did. We well, I, now I never knew that. No. Yeah. We were together. Yeah. Who saw it first? <laughs> I did. I did. But Neil wanted to carry it, and he held my feet while I leaned over the edge. Oh, wow. <laughs> out of the side of the hill. So we had a How old were you at that time? day. Baby. And then we went on. She, she, was, she was six years old. Wow. Neil wanted, all the kids had gone bowling. And Neil was crying because he couldn't go bowling. So I said to him, you and I are going to go out and find treasure. <laughs> so that made Neil very happy. And when we went out, we found treasure. And then we had, Nina wanted it. She delivered. Of course. Because it was on her property. Yes. And then, then she relented and let me have it. And then she didn't change her mind again, and she took it back. And then she 
got very uh, emotional about it and decided she had to give it back to me. So finally, <laughs> and in between then, it got analyzed by the museum. But anyway, now I have it, and uh, I'm going to return it to, uh, to, to, to Leo because it's part of your, your family. Yes. But I'm keeping it until then because okay. I love it. Yes. I love the idea. The only thing is that somewhere in that long journey, it got a nick in it. Who knows who put the nick in? But uh, the, uh, the experts at the museum yes. were able to brighten the pattern uh -huh. and make it stand out it's a little better. It's getting warm. But it, was, it is a remarkable pot because mm. it was intact. And along with that, I have one piece of um, used bone, a, a little flat, long piece that came out of that place. Um, it's probably may, a needle. Probably a needle or something. And I think there may be one other thing that came from there. And uh, let's see what else. There were black polished stones on your place. No, just this for Okay, is it on? Yeah, just look in there. Oh, yeah. It's going? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so tell me about right, the house. I'll tell you about that whole house. Okay. It and was... Kind of hold it against yeah. your body or something. Okay. So you can yeah. We moved okay. into it. There. See if it's going. Yeah. Uh, it is rumored, and I don't know if this is correct, that it costs $200,000 to build. Uh, it was designed by Harry Allen Jacobs, an architect. And I don't know how much Neil had to do, Nina had to do with the design. I don't know what she's responsible for. Uh, I know that she got the modern furniture, the table with two triangles on which the weight is placed. And I know that there was this beautiful fruit bowl made of silver that was very modern and beautiful. Okay, I want to ask you about that table. Was it uh, just an angle like this? On uh, uh, just an angle, triangle? That the two, two, two angular. Yes. Things, one at each end of the table, and then a yes. flat, flat top. And do you know who designed that no, table? No, I don't. But okay. I know that it was a. Nina might have designed it for all I know. You know I what I think? I think it was a table that was initially designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Really? The reason I know this is that um, George O'Keefe had the same table she in did. her house in Abiquiu, and my father had the same, mother had the same table designed for our house at Indian Spring Farm. And then George, my brother, copied that table. He has it in his house. Very simple to make. Very simple. But when I saw that table in Abiquiu a few years ago, I asked about it. The woman I know there said that it was originally a Frank Lloyd Wright table well, design. Well, that would be very interesting to find and in Frank Lloyd Wright's biography yeah. or something you must be able yeah. to. So, uh -huh. Mother Nina furnished that house. M mother what? My mother, Nina, did the furnishings of the house. Yes, she did. I think, and I remember she had a studio that was very unique. There was a sofa, and at both ends were two large wooden um, pieces that that the sides opened and you could put in very large pictures. Huh. And the walls, I think, were a uh, monk's cloth or something. A cloth. And that was Nina's studio and the bedroom was next, next to it. And I inherited that bedroom when Nina was no longer there. And was and that the one with the bed that folded down? Or was that the previous house? No, that was our original okay. house in 38 West 83rd Street. I can describe that house, but I've done it already. And yeah. 
in so the... Tell me again the name of yeah. the architect of the new house. Uh, on I think 80. it was Harry Allen Jacobs. And the address? 49 East 80th. Okay. Now let me just tell you the history of the house because yeah. that's very funny. When father died, mother, it was too much and there was nobody living there anymore. So uh, mother wanted to sell the house and uh, she sold it for $40,000 is what I seem to remember. It was the worst yeah. time. And she sold it to a wealthy couple and they had terrible fights and they finally sued each other for the divorce. So the big thing was who would get the house. They fought off over the house. And the, the house made the newspapers, you know, the house that this wealthy couple were fighting over. So finally she ended up getting the house. And then at some point, Barbara Streisand saw this uh, doorway and thought that it was an absolutely wonderful house as an Art Deco house, and she bought it. And rumor has it that she paid something like $400,000 for it. Well, she immediately hired a decorator, and then the house went in the newspapers again. And I think she put red flocked wallpaper in the house uh, and sort of mixed terrible. Victorian and, uh. and, and Art Deco together. But it is said that she bought the house because of it, of that, that front door. Not only the front door, but the curved staircase also uh, made of Monel metal. I'm sorry? Oh, is it okay to hold it sideways like that? Well, I just thought it shows more of Lydia's face. I don't know why it would hurt anything. You won't make it backward, upside down or something? Well, I don't have no idea. I've never okay. used it. I'll I go can back. actually back it up a little bit. There's a... Um, okay. Um, is that close to you? Oh, you're going to see it? Oh, that's better. Okay, that's better. Well, anyway, okay, anyway, so she, she redid she, the house in some mix of styles. Yeah, but she never moved in. And I know that she tried to move into Aunt Rosalie's hotel, and they didn't want her because they thought an actress would be too noisy. So she, she was rejected as a prospect for where Aunt Rosalie lived on Madison Avenue. Now, I didn't realize that was a hotel where Rosalie, Aunt Rosalie, was living. It was a residential hotel. Huh. Okay. And, uh, but anyway, they didn't let her in there. And I don't remember if because she was turned down, she bought or vice versa. Now, anyway, why did the family, why did well, your parents yeah. decide to move to this address on 80th Street? How come they... That happened. Well, I think that it was a time when the neighborhood yeah, yeah. was see. very shabby. Yeah. Down at and did they hire the architect to do it, or did mother? Yes. I, they, I guess they bought the land and, and hired an architect. Maybe there was a building there. There must have been a building that we did. And so I wonder if the house that in Falls Church that my parents had and designed had some of these elements. It certainly, I remember it as having a curved staircase that was very sort of art deco yes. or art well, of that you know, period. The curved staircase was a wonderful feature because it gave curves to a house that yes. had no curves in it. And, uh, you know, art deco was really never very graceful. It was. Art, well, art, it must have been Art Nouveau then. Art it sort of, Nouveau it was had that. beautiful, beautiful yeah. curves. And, and actually, yeah. Nina yeah. bought sort of Bauhaus yeah. furniture with the curves the, the, for that house, and some uh, two pieces of which I still have, uh -huh. uh, little sofa chairs. And I have a beautiful bureau that's from that period still that I kept. 
Okay, well, that's that, but then uh, let me finish the Barbara yes. Streisand yeah. story. Oh, this is good. So eventually she decided to sell the house, but when she, before she sold the house, she decided to have a big party and raise money for something. So she had a big party, and uh, then she she raised, she sold, she probably sold some of the furniture then. Wow, too. yeah. Who knows? Uh, but anyway, so the, the house made the newspaper at the time of that party, and then it made the newspaper again uh, when it got sold. And uh, there was, one of them has a great picture of Barbara uh, standing at that front door, uh, holding the door. And uh, then in the last few years, there was an article in the Times about that whole block of houses. Wow. And how there were all kinds of modern features that were noteworthy architecturally just in that, that particular block between Madison and Park Avenue. I'll have to go there next time I'm in New York and yes, take a look. Now, somewhere along the line. Put it in your ear. I'm supposed I'm to put it in your What is this? Quit because you've been guided a half an hour since intermission was declared. Okay. Well, I don't know how to turn this off. Let That's me see right. if I can figure it out. It's probably just push. Can you hear Let that? Let me see. Light photo. I'm sorry, I'm such a nitwit with this kind of new technology. Mother, I'm putting some. The guy who called himself Pedro Long for the tape. Tell that story again. Oh. Well, when the. Uh, there was a man who gave great help to the Allies and against Mussolini during the war, mm -hmm. an Italian, and he went by the pseudonym of Pietro Longhi. His name is something else, and it's in our guest book. But anyway, he, they, they hid him in one church after another, and he carried cash on his body, enormous sums of cash wow. to the Allies. Wow. And uh, so he was a hero to the, to the Allies. Yeah. Well, after the war, he came to this country, and mother met him, and uh, you know here we, here we were with our Pietro Longhi paintings, and this man called himself <laughs> Pietro Longhi. Well, I met him. Yeah. And uh, he said, "How do you do? How many children do you have?" And I said, "I have four. And he said, "That's funny. Somehow I see you with five. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got five children. <laughs> Neil, that's why I had you. Pietro Longhi. Pietro Longhi. Yeah. And uh, then the, the last painting did not sell. Good night. In and so the family decided to give it to our foundation. We had a foundation for a couple of years because we had an uneven income. Uh -huh. <coughs> So the, the, the foundation had to decide what to do with this log, which needed some attention, cleaning and so forth. So we gave it to the Los Angeles Museum, and uh, they didn't have a, one of these longies. And the longies were very interesting, because longi actually did portraits of people, but set in living rooms doing things. And in one of them, the one that our family delighted in, there was a lady cheating, cheating at cards. <laughs> and, and we all loved that. You could see her hiding, hiding that card. And the other one, which we thought was the most valuable, were men in masks and tricornered hats, somebody up on a stage. And I can't remember which one I think that was the one that brought so much money, but uh, I yeah. don't remember now. Now, Lydia, at one time I went to Europe 
and I went with, I don't remember how many of these Longy paintings, to take to London to be sold at auction. Right. And I went to Yehudi Menuhin to give the paintings to him, and he took them to the auction house. Oh, good. So, so they that got, may have they been were the auctioned, but they were auctioned off. They were auctioned, and I, I have the Sotheby catalog. Yes, Sotheby's I in London. I I still have them. Yeah. Because if I don't, then I must have given them with the art. Maybe you gave them with the other. But I don't know. Well, I can take a look for it. We haven't yeah. looked in the third drawer yeah. here. Do you have that? Show. Did you know that story about the purchase of the longies? Um, a lot of stories I've heard and I just yeah. forgotten them. Well, this was. I'll just repeat it for the tape. That uh, uh, Papa Poppy is what we called him. Uh, bought the paintings for eight hundred dollars when Nona was first pregnant. Eight fifty, I think. Eight fifty, all five. What? All of them for eight fifty. Yes. And uh, she made was so upset because she felt they didn't have the money. Uh -huh. So she made him return them, and then she changed her mind that she had no right to stop him from buying something so dear to his heart and from his wow. Venetian town. But she went back and made it, uh, told the dealer they were going to get them after all. Yes, now, great. They had an amazing story, but I'm sure you've heard this, and they have, is that when I went to Europe with Father maybe when I was 16 years old or something like that. We went to Venice and we walked towards a bridge and it, you know they could kind of curved upward yes. and coming the other direction appeared Love. the head of a man with Love. red hair mm -hmm. and as he climbed his side you could see him and Father looked at this man, threw up his hands and said, Gerolo Movivante. And the man jumped back as if he'd been shot. And uh, Father said, Gerolo Movivante, Lionello Pereira. Mm -hmm. And this was a little boy he'd gone to school oh. with 50 something years before. <laughs> and Father recognized him immediately. I guess it was the red hair. And uh, that was a very exciting moment, which I witnessed. In did, you, did you learn Italian? Were you when I was good, small, pretty fluent in Italian? Mm. Did you speak Italian pretty well? Yes, I still do. I can't understand why I don't forget it. <laughs> well, because you learned it as a kid. I learned French and Italian at the same time never forgot either of them, know all the most complicated words, which I just come to me out of thin air suddenly, and, you know, the, the word for combustible or so, whatever. <laughs> <coughs> I don't understand how I remember this or how I ever came into contact with that particular word or any, any particular word, but I find that even though my it's rusty, if I speak for yeah. half an hour, right. I'm back. back again. But uh, well, there are. It was absolutely yeah. wonderful to have had that opportunity. Yes. And any language that I learned later, I never learned right. as well. It's not the same. And tell I, me, Lydia, did everybody learn Italian in the family? Your everybody brothers? did, but I think I was the only you were the one best. that that continued to use okay. it as much. Uh -huh. And I think I had a better accent. Mother spoke it, but she had a very poor accent. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want you to tell me a little bit about Willa Cather. Well, she what, was, you, what the connection with the family was, because she I She was a remember. patient of Uncle Charles. Ah, okay. okay. So he had a number of um, thank you letters or Photographs of Willa Cow. Oh. That's the only. Connection. That's the only connection. Now uh, the other connection is that Willa Kappa became a great friend of the menu. Okay. And that was totally unrelated to. Okay. To this, right. and it just happened that they yes. they met her somehow, 
and she was a great friend of theirs. And Peggy, tell me a little bit about mother's friendship with Peggy DeBrock. I think Peggy probably went to high school with Nina. Ah, that's I'm good. not sure. Yeah. Her name was Peggy Strauss. Okay. And uh, they were great bosom friends. And that was that. Did you have nannies? Did I have what? A nanny as you were growing up? I know mother did at certain I times. I had a governess. Yes. And her name was Marie Brugger. And her sister was the governess for the Martinelli children. And so that's how I got to know the Martinellis, because they had two children, Bettina and Antonio. They lived on the... Central Park West, and I would go to their birthday parties. And I remember the games I played at that birthday party. They had one which was a spider web, and you got the end of a string, and you had to get to your present. And the <laughs> other one was a game in which you had a piece of string, and at the other end of it was a piece of candy, and you could not use your hands. You had to get it into your mouth. And I was the great player of that because I have a, one of those incredible tongues that is very powerful and can turn circles. And, and did you know that the power to bend your tongue and hold it like that is, is in your genes? I just learned that. And the way you cross your arms is in your genes too. Have you heard of a singer named Maria Cheritza? No. She was known for all her tricks and the, the terrible jokes she played on people and made their life miserable on stage. You never knew what she'd do next. Hmm. Well, anyway, in one opera, there had been an opera the night, the day before, in which they let a lot of balloons up to the ceiling, and the balloons were floating down during our opera, and here was, was Martinelli and a, this big fat opera singer, hand in hand, sort of floating backwards with the balloons coming down in between them. And of course, we were sure he was going to step on a balloon, so was everybody else in the audience sure that he was going to step on a balloon. And uh, so we went into hysteria, just absolute convulsions of laughter and uh, it's the kind of thing we did at the opera. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a bass singer or tenor? Yeah, tenor. tenor. Oh, Yachi. And Yachi. And Yachi. One more story. Okay. They were, first of all, he had a mistress. Of course. A lovely French um, named That's okay. Oh, okay. And it was Maybe famous. Famous. He never took his wife anywhere. Oh. She was a very plain woman, very nice. And uh, but he, he was, did he openly take his mistress around? Oh, yes. Okay. He took her all her own. Colette Darville was her name. Colette Darville. 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 I think it was Darville like me. Huh. Anyway. He always had her around, but never Mrs. Martinelli, which was a hard thing for Mrs. Martinelli to take. Well, really? Well, well there are lots of stories connected here. Yeah. But, um, oh, also, toward the end of his career, he came to dinner one night, and I think maybe he had crab meat or something. Anyway, in the middle of the opera that night, he got sick to his stomach right on stage. Oh, <laughs> God. And so, you know, does he disown you after that? No, not at all. But anyway, we had a terrible time deciding that mother had poisoned him or not. Did you go, did your father's favorite uh, opera composer, was it Verdi? Was it who? Verdi. Mother's favorite. Mother's favorite. 
mother's favorite because it was Toscanini's favorite. Oh. And how about your father? I really don't know one word about what he liked and what he didn't really? like. He fell asleep very <laughs> well, and, and but he went to all these. I mean, mother could go to three opera, three concerts a day, and I was dragged along. It's no wonder that I really didn't. Uh, I really didn't appreciate music. I was very, you know, keenly critical about music because I heard the sure. best. Yes. I heard the best all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I heard Paderewski, I heard any, everybody you can think of. And uh, I heard Yehudi from the day he first came to the East, and I remember the concerts and how in those days people threw flowers and they ran down the aisles and they collected at the end of the aisles and looked adoringly at the stage. I remember all these scenes, it was just beautiful. And uh, anyway, I can, I can, you know, tell you about it, all of how everybody played and what their characteristics I'll were. I have to come back to that. But I never knew, I never knew, uh, I never knew anything musical about them. I, mm -hmm. I knew them personally. Right. And so I knew anecdotes yeah. that are real. Yeah. But I really was not educated musically. At all. Well, you were educated by listening. I listened. Yes. That's a huge education. That's a huge education. And hearing the best, you're you're obviously very knowledgeable without even realizing about music. Who is you are? I am knowledgeable. Yes, because you heard the best, and you heard a huge variety of classical music. Yes, well, I can tell you about the styles of these different. Well, okay. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I can tell you, I can recognize some some players. I know what mm -hmm. Rudolf Serkin sounds like. Mm -hmm. and I know what some other people sound like. Let, let, let me ask you one question because I'm foggy on the details. When did Rosalie come to live with you? Rosalie. Your cousin, Rosalie. Lane. On and off. Ah, when Lane. I was a child. See, Rosalie when Lane. mother was away, she would uh, have Aunt Florine living with us. I see. Okay. And if mother went to Europe without okay. me, uh, Aunt Florine would take care of I see. Okay. And poor Aunt Florine, so many times uh, something awful would happen. Uh -huh. I got scarlet fever when Mother was away, and the uh, antidote anti to scarlet fever was an injection, and my leg got paralyzed, and I got welts all over me. Poor Aunt Florine was there. Uh, when I got my first period, she was there. When I got anything, it was always poor Aunt Florine who had to take care of me. So Rosalie and Roger were part of the family. Yes. More Roger than Rosalie. Yeah. I don't know. Uh -huh. Maybe she's away at school or something. Right. Yeah. But uh, Roger lived with us quite a quite a yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. And. Uh, I don't remember too much about them as children. Yeah, I was just just what confused about how that happened. Thanks for clarifying that. Yes. Well, it was all, yeah. and also, mother, uh, mother and father sort of guaranteed at Florine's being able to live. Yes. Because apparently, um, Mr. Lyons, Alfred Lyons, was not a wealthy man didn't leave her with anything much. And, but she was able to keep her apartment mm -hmm. in um, West 86th Street. It was uh -huh. a whole block with a, an apartment house that surrounded a courtyard uh -huh. in the middle. And Florine lived there for years and years, and then Rosalie lived there. Oh. And um, so that, that yeah. was, and they, they were under rent control. 
Right. It was yeah. terrific. How long did your mother live at East 91st Street? East? 91st. 95th. How First. long did Rosalie live at No, East? your mother. Your mother. When you she, moved to 91st Street, what? How long was oh, she I don't there? I don't know how many years. Because oh. that's, that's I when I knew her. her. Yeah. Mother lived at 88th Street. Um. Hmm. Mother lived at East 88th Street at the last place she lived, and uh, I don't know the number of years yeah. that anything yeah. happened. Yeah. It's 91st Street, wasn't it? I thought that was the last one. I thought that was the last. I think 95th Street was where Rosalie lived. Yeah. Rosalie lived at 6 East 95th. Right. Yeah. That was Rosalie. Mother lived at 15 East 91st Street. Yeah. Wasn't that it? Yep, yeah, that sounds that's where familiar. I remember, yeah. But she then had that apartment on 88th Street uh, that Charles inherited. Oh, yes. And yeah. that uh, Sylvia did. And Sylvia did after that. Yeah. And then there was, and Charles uh, had the job of inheriting Aunt Rose. Well, he didn't inherit it, but he had to dispose, dispose of Aunt Rosalie's apartment in the Carlisle and he was embarrassed to sell it for a lot of money uh, so he sold it for very little money. He didn't what a fool. In profiting from <laughs> other things. Too bad. bad. Too bad. Yeah. You know Charles had to, I can still see him every time they said go easy on the water you know don't use any more water there's a drought this year you could see Charles after dinner taking the dirty dish water cup by cup and watering all his plants in Scarsdale. <laughs> he he was absolutely, you know, one hundred percent save everything. Don't mm -hmm. don't be don't be greedy, don't yeah. this and this. And where do you get that from? Nona? The, the Society of Friends, I think. Probably, yeah. Quaker. Maybe his wife, maybe, uh, what's her name? Ruth. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth was, was very was much Quaker. Like that. It was the Quaker religion, yeah. Yeah. which 